Uh, welcome everyone to our first seminar for the search and matching workshop. Uh, we're happy to have a Jason today. He's going to talk about systematic risk in financial network and the role of maturity. Okay, Jason, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, we can see the good. Yeah. Okay, that's all good. Yes. All right, so, uh, so many thanks for the invitation. Sorry for the, you know, the chaos scheduling and the chaos also uh, uh, to get me here uh, at the last minute. Um, I was having trouble with too many dimensions on the computer. Uh, nice to see everybody anyway, uh, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot uh, for the invitation. So indeed, I'm Jason, and I'm happy to talk to you about this sort of uh, project with uh, Georgia Piccentino, who's not here. She really wanted to be here, but she's uh, eight months pregnant and had to go to the doctor and uh everything's okay and uh, for usual stuff and uh with shabo who is here and is a great phd student at columbia so the project indeed is called systemic risk in financial networks revisited and also indeed there's a, a subtitle called the role of maturity so let me start with some facts about that stuff about uh financial networks and uh maturity so uh banks are connected in networks of debt right? and you know, we have gross debts, which are a lot bigger than, or they have gross debts, which are a lot bigger in principle than their net debts. So uh, if Brianna and I are two banks uh, and I owe her $10 and she owes me $9, then my gross position is 10, but my net position is just 10 minus nine is one. And so 10% of my gross position. And that's sort of not that far-fetched, not as far-fetched as maybe you would think. For example, uh, for UK banks, you can look up, uh, bank total interbank position just in their annual statements and we did this for a number of them so here's an example of hsbc's and so their net position uh when we looked it up anyway for the uh was uh 24 billion pounds i think in interbank assets 21 and a half billion pounds in interbank liabilities so that's two other banks right? and that means their uh, net that's their those are their gross positions their net position is to 24 minus 21 and a half so uh, so two and a half billion pounds or about 10 percent of the gross position of 24. So it's these growth positions are a lot bigger than the net positions, and that's often thought to harbor systemic risk, for example, through domino effects of default. And as a result, a number of policymakers advocate just netting these positions out. So instead of having me owe Brianna 10 and Brianna owe me one, I owe, uh, we just tear up those two contracts and replace them with one contract equaling the net position, I owe her one instead. And that, uh, so I, that sort of policy prescription is supported by a lot of uh, networks models. Uh, so one example is this paper by Asimolu, Azdeglar, and Tabal Salahi, which I'll refer to as uh, AOT uh, here after, uh, which because it's a sort of relevant benchmark for what we're doing. Uh, and those models, and more or less all the sort of network models of debt that we know, except for a couple of exceptions uh, that are sort of, I think, somewhat limited that we discuss in the paper, are based on one period debt. And that one period debt, I think, is a good model if what you want to do is to uh, capture overnight debts, for example, the repo market. Right? But it turns out uh, that a lot of uh, interbank debt is actually of longer maturity. Um, so a number of papers look at this uh, sort of maturity empirically using data from Germany. And in Germany, apparently, the average maturity of interbank debt is more than one year. And the fraction uh, of overnight debt is less than 10%. So this is a paper about the other sort of 90% or is what we're trying to talk about. Uh, and in it, we try to address uh, among, uh, other, among others the following questions. So I want to understand, do long-term debt networks harbor the same kinds of systemic risks as short? Is it also true that netting out is a good thing to sort of mitigate uh, the systemic risk and increase efficiency? And do the same network structures lead risks uh, to propagate? And so. Uh, there's sort of, for example, there's an idea that uh, really tightly connected networks, or a result I guess that really tightly connected networks are fragile in the presence of really large uh, shocks, and that's uh, true with short-term debt. Is it also true uh, with uh, long-term debt? And then we also want to ask: Do these gross debts serve some economic function that could be undermined if the if we tear up these contracts and, and net them out? So. Uh, you know, we have in mind, of course, that these things are there for a reason, and we should understand that reason if we want to uh, sort of make policy prescriptions on what we should do about it. Right. So in this paper, we're going to try to address these questions in a model in which there are M banks, and they're connected in a network of just long-term debt. So we're just going to focus on the long-term part of this interbank network. And <clears throat> in the model, to sort of preview what we do, we say uh, uh, these banks have long-term 
assets. Why? For example, loans to outside the banking system, uh, corporate loans and mortgages, but they could suffer a liquidity shock uh, of a size of size L. So this liquidity shock could represent, you know, having a uh, to pay out on an insurance contract, excuse me, <coughs> or a derivative, or to some extent, it could also represent a deposit withdrawal. Jason, can I ask a question? Please. Uh, so that earlier number, twenty-four billion, uh, like, what does that really include? I was curious because some of these derivatives, it's very hard to net them out, right? Like they they can be exotic. Uh, but no, sorry, I think that was not derivatives. I, I think it's like loans and blah blah blah. Like I think loans and commitments or something to other banks. Okay, that's sort of what the entry sounds yeah. something like that. So I I think it's mainly uh, you know term debts to to other banks. Okay, because I think you know it's really important. The maturity structure is really important for netting, also because I think these banks already usually do have bilateral netting agreements, right? when it is perhaps feasible or practical. So, so the extent to which they have bilateral netting agreements, I don't know uh, why these, I guess they're not, so whether they're netting a bilateral, this paper is not just about bilateral netting, oh, okay. although we'll show that there's a reason to sort of have even, even, so even if it's with the same bank, there might be a reason not to net out. Um, and I guess we're gonna. I'm gonna tell you a reason why it might not be a sort of practical. Oh, okay. Okay. that uh, there's some there's an advantage to to keeping these things on your balance sheet. Um, okay, so so in the model, so they could suffer a liquidity shock. Okay, so I'll do what that could represent, and we want this liquidity shock to have teeth. So liquidity risk bites, and how does liquidity risk bite? Well, it bites because we're going to assume. Uh, a friction, which is that there's limited pledgeability. So I, as a bank, can pledge only a fraction theta of these long-term assets. Why? To borrow if I need to meet the shock, right? Uh, right. So what is it, and when does this sort of really matter? Well, it matters under the following assumption, that the value of these assets exceeds the size of the liquidity shock. So liquidation is therefore inefficient, but I'd like to continue and produce Y, even if that costs L. However, the size of the liquidity shock exceeds theta y, the pledgeable fraction of my assets, so that uh, I, the liquidity shock or the assets are not in the sense, in the sense self-financing. So let me show you uh, what it means for limited pledgeability to, to buy this as a little bit of a preview. So my bank, so BI for I for I, I, this is my balance sheet. On the asset side of my balance sheet, I've got some long-term investments, which we call Y. And the liability side, I could suffer a short-term liquidity shock. And if I do suffer that shock, I have to pay that. Now, under the assumption I told you, if this were my whole balance sheet, I would be inefficiently liquidated. Why? Because I can only borrow to raise theta y. Theta y is less than L. So I can't meet L. I get liquidated. And that's inefficient because y is greater than L. Now, but that's not my whole balance sheet. My whole balance sheet includes debt from Brianna as an interbank claim on the asset side of my balance sheet and debt to Brianna and interbank liability on the liability side of my balance sheet and possibly other debts to and from all y'all. And we'll talk about that structure a lot. Uh, and sort of our first main result is that those off what seem like zero net off, perfectly offsetting interbank debts and which would be perfectly offsetting and just net out entirely in the Valrazian model uh, actually don't uh, net out, they have positive uh, net present value. Kathy, please. Kathy, you have your hand up, right? Um, so, yes, yes. Um, just clarifying question. So the the liquidation um, value you are talking about borrowing from outside network. Uh, is that uh, when you borrow inside the network, so bilateral relationship allow you to borrow at a slightly less discount? Is that the distinction? I think there was a so, theta, I didn't so you can so you can borrow uh, based on your asset, which is a basically liquidity your asset as theta y, which is less than your liability. Right? You, you just mentioned it's now the worthwhile to liquidate your asset and you receive. Um, uh, liquidation right. shock. Um, when you liquidate, you're selling to uh, the general public. Mm -hmm. And you can also um, borrow against um, um, your debt from BJ 
um, exactly. since that's, 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 you're taking yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It's bilateral relation. Slide. Yeah, yeah. The bilateral relationship give you less discount. Give me what? The bilateral relationship you borrow from somebody you know using collateral. Right. From somebody I know. So that's we'll sort of relationship role. aspect. I, I think I'm not um, going whatever to whatever the network say. play a role here in, uh, in this regard is because of bilateral relationship, you're getting less liquidation um, discount. Uh, no, that's not that's not something that we're going to talk about. So I guess at all. So the these assets are really uh, so the why is bank specific. And uh, you know, I, they they realize value why only if I as a bank continue them to I hold them until maturity. Otherwise, I can you know liquidate them, and another bank might be able to uh, uh, realize value theta y for them. So if you if you want to say that one micro foundation of a theta is that it's a relationship loan to a corporate borrower, then absolutely that's one micro foundation because me as the sort of relationship lender, I can realize value y. If I liquidate the loan, then a non-relationship lender uh, might uh, not be able to extract as much value or roll over and continue the relationship with the borrower. That that other lender can realize only theta y. That's definitely a micro foundation. So that I'm sort of, I'm not going to model anything more than just having a theta. Y. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, yes. I just wonder how I'll introduce. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll wait a bit more okay. uh, to to raise this question again. Okay, so sorry if I did not get it entirely, but uh, hopefully uh, we can talk more. Okay, so the first main result I want to talk about is that these, what seem like these zero net debts, right, when they are sort of zero net debts and they would have no role in the Valrazian model, in this model, uh, have positive NPV. And in fact, high indebtedness, interbank indebtedness, uh, and connectedness, so, you know, having tight, tight connections with long-term debt are sources of value and stability or efficient, uh, and efficiency. Okay, so in other words, zero net long-term positions have positive net present value. And what's the reason for that? When I have these offsetting or offsetting debts with Brianna, when I get hit by the liquidity shock, I can borrow not only against my theta line, but I also have can borrow by pledging her claim, my claim, her debt to me in the market. And that increases the amount of sort of pledgeable assets I have to borrow against. It basically creates collateral. Now, with long-term debt on the liability side of my uh, balance sheet, that debt can be diluted because it's not due immediately when I need liquidity. So I can borrow expropriating value from Brianna. Right? So in other words, these offsetting long-term debts embed an option to dilute with new debt to a third party. And since I exercise this option to dilute when I need liquidity, they embed, it provides liquidity insurance. And that's why it creates value because this uh, network provides insurance. So there's insurance, of course, insurance is just a contingent transfer, but you see that we're implementing contingent transfers via just plain debt. And then it's reminiscent of an idea that goes back at, at least at least to uh, Dubi, Ginnikopoulos, and Schubert, that the option to default implements a contingent transfer, uh, which can be valuable. And this extends that idea by saying not just the option to default, which you'll also see plays a role in our model, but also the option to dilute creates sort of a more valuable or more uh, sort of finer contingencies. Now, at this point, you might ask, you know, so are high indebtedness and high connectedness enough to implement efficiency? More indebtedness and more connectedness are good, at least in, in a specific sense. Uh, but is that enough to get all the way to the constrained, uh, efficient outcome? And the answer is going to be no, and I'll show you that. For example, the complete network doesn't implement, in general, the constrained, efficient outcome. But there's a class of networks that, to our knowledge, has not yet been studied in the literature, called, which we sort of term the exponential uh, networks. And these networks will show... Uh, um, implement optimal transfers or constrained optimal transfers, no matter the distribution of shocks. So we say that these, uh, so we sort of say that these networks are robust, but never fragile. And they're robust sort of in two senses, one in the sense of like robust in the sort of informal policy sense of stability, but also because they're uh, the optimal networks for any shocks, they're robust in the sense of a robust control. So Kathy, did you raise your hand again? I, maybe I saw some, some uh, no, okay. All right, and then just one thing to say to sort of emphasize that these results might matter. We think the results matter for policy, at least at uh, um, a high level, that uh, the policies that might help with short-term debt can backfire with long-term debt because decreasing indebtedness and connectedness can decrease efficiency. 
Jason, so can I ask a question? Where I'm going, uh, and we're ready to launch in. Uh, I can take some questions. A clarifying question. Uh, Please. So it's actually a very smart idea. I really like it. Uh, I'm confused about one thing, though. Like, uh, so I'm going to borrow using my, maybe I've misunderstood, using my, like, uh, using the gross debt as collateral. So I don't want to net it out so it's larger in a way, right? But whoever is going to lend to me that theta y knows that at the time of making those payments, right, whatever I get from the other bank, and then I'll have to pay back something. So why doesn't, why doesn't the person who is going to lend to me think of the net debt as a pledgeable collateral rather than the gross? Because that person also understands I have to pay the other bank that I have not met. Yes. No, so great question. So I think in the in the highest level, like the, sim the simplest answer is that I'm going to assume that you can borrow with more senior debt. So these offsetting debts, and this is what we have in, in mind by thinking that they're long maturity, that you can borrow either with debt that's effectively more senior, either by borrowing shorter term or by pledging collateral or by, as uh, sort of the example I'll talk about is a repo, which as you know, are bankruptcy remote. So they're effectively super senior and, you, and they can dilute this existing debt. So that it has to be, Perfectly, uh, strictly senior is not essential. All that matters is that you extract value from the existing debt. Does that make sense? So some of the value that I would have paid to Brianna goes to the new creditor and that loosens my financial constraint, uh, which, I, which you know, is I think true of any, even, even with carry pass debt, that, that result, uh, I mean, that's, that you extract value from existing debt when you borrow more. Makes sense, thanks. Okay. Emre and Jing, please just uh, yeah, shout at me. Go ahead, Jing. Oh, so um, I'm going to ask about like the seniority of the balance sheet. Uh, in earlier models, you do already have like um, senior debt. Um, and I can also see the, uh, the interplay of uh, the uh, rich sharing of the network and uh, how that goes to meet the senior debt. Um, and now here you have the long, uh, the, the maturity uh, structure <clears throat> coming in and you kind of have two layers of network. Um, so I'm wondering uh, first uh, if your model can embed the earlier models with each bank say they have some senior liability um, like tax and deposits and et cetera. Um, and how, uh, second, how are the implications different? So let me just try to ask, so if we have all, so what models do you have in mind, by the way? Oh, uh, so, so it's like uh, in, in those um, network structures, uh, each bank may have already have senior debt and this kind be thought of as some outside nodes to pin down the interbank payment. And there I already see some interplay, say uh, interbank liquidity sharing, they may first go to meet the senior debt and this has implications on the network fragility in terms of the structure. And now you seem like um, each bank, so, so the senior debt or, um, of the banks have some uh, network structure. Is that? So then I can say a few things. So, mm -hmm. so in model, like just for example, like in AOT, all banks have like, a, they have the sort of V that they're all, uh, that all banks owe sort of outside the system, which they say could capture yeah, yeah, all yeah. which are in general senior. The closer mm -hmm. mapping in this model to that, I mean, actually, I mean, I'll show you in a benchmark um, sort of more closely the relationship with that model. Um, is uh, the liquidity shock is closer to those senior those senior debts, so something that you have to pay or immediately a debt one that's uh, sort of senior to all your other liabilities is a closer mapping to the liquidity shock. In this paper, we have not at this point uh, studied the two networks, the sort of overlapping networks, and I think that's you know something that I shouldn't say we haven't. I mean, I, honestly, Shabo, I think I've worked quite a bit on on that version of the model uh, where you have both. A network of senior of of one seniority and a network of another senior uh, sorry a network of like short term debt we did it with short term debt but it's very close to to high seniority debt in this model a network of short term debt and a network of long term debt over top of it 
I mean, I, I, I don't think we got too far uh, with that, um, but uh, in this paper, we're only going to tell you. About, I'm only going to tell you about the network of long-term deaths. Uh, for sure, that's on the to-do list, and uh, we have we have, you know, we have some stuff, but not uh, nothing to report. I think at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, I see there uh, there is implications on the uh, on the maturity. Thank you. Thanks. So, quick question. So, um, if banks, I mean, here you take the long term that network as exogenous, right? But yes, you, I have some conjectures about uh, what the, if the, you it could, say. I mean, it seems like this under your assumption, it can it can be gamed, right? So, I I would like lend to you, and I would borrow from you, and then now I have a lot of long term uh, you owe me a lot long term so now i can use that as collateral to borrow and um and so what stops us from like basically uh, i think uh, it's almost the, the opposite so it in other models i think they typically want to just net them out and in this model if there, if there are just two banks for example i can tell you that it's optimal to keep those debts there it's not you don't games. want to net them out here right you want to blow them up you just want to blow them up and you would do that yeah, and that would be stops you pray, from, to, pray to improving yeah what stops you from creating an enormous balance sheet then i mean so i will actually tell you that a big balance sheet is optimal and that seems to be uh, and there's a limit about which it's no longer and uh, there's no longer any use to it uh, but a big balance sheet is good and that seems to be pretty consistent with uh, what banks uh, banks look like um if you want to say in extensions we have costs we sort of add costs to just having a lot of debt. Just for example, you might default on your interbank debts. And I'll, I'll tell you uh, a bit about how those extensions sort of put a limit uh, on why you might not want to get so, so big, but you do want to get a, have a big balance sheet here. And I think that's true. I mean, I guess my worry is that if, if banks are like artificially expanding their balance sheets, then, then it would be a little bit more difficult to argue that now these can be used as collateral because whoever is lending against this collateral would be worried. It's not artificial, it, it's it's optimal. I mean, it's it serves as concrete economic purpose, which is this co-insurance. Right. Anyway. Well, let's, I mean, let's, let's see how it works. Uh, Inji, go. Hey, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I came in hey. a little bit late. There, there was a Zoom, Zoom me, issue. Me too. <laughs> just want to ask a clarifying question. Is the idea that uh, when banks have liquidity shocks later on, so the, the ability to, to dilute their long-term interbank claims helps them uh, helps mm -hmm. them to obtain funding later on, so act as insurance. Is this the main part of the? Because I, I missed the yes. part of the. I would say yeah. I would say that's the main thing okay. behind Zion. Yeah, just a real quick question, and feel free to delay. So, what's the contracting restrictions you have at the initial date? Uh, no, just uh, this is per Emery's question uh, that. Uh, we take the interbank network as exogenous. So at the initial date, we just have a network in place. Now I'll show you that that network is constrained optimal. So in that sense, uh, I conjecture that uh, you know, even if banks could do any contract, they'd still want to be in there. Certainly a planner would want to. Want yeah. to uh, so my, my point, my, my, my concern was like, whether there's any ex ante kind of, you know, interbank risk, risk sharing schemes, which can be useful. Uh, maybe, you know, you already have it or ha have that in part of the, part of the, uh, interbank network arrangement. But I think the point is that you don't need these ex-ante schemes if you can just do debt because debt okay. plus the option to dilute is going to get us to the constraint efficient outcome. Okay. Uh, with, the right, with the right network. I mean, with the right yeah, network. Is, so net, Thank I you. Just, maybe I should say networks of debt. I mean, and that's in some sense that contribution, one of the contributions to the paper, right, is that in some sense we know that the option to dilute can provide financial flexibility. So we don't know how that interacts with the network of debt that you have, I think, I, I think before this paper. John, please. Hey, Jason. Good to see you. Hey, good to see I you soon. To... <laughs> I want to ask questions. I don't know whether you want to delay it, but uh, is it important that these networks of uh, debt are observable to everyone? So I'm thinking about the concern of non-exclusivity. I mean, maybe a bit like Elmer's questions, right? If it's everything done in an OPEC way, then I might borrow too much and then just default on all my claims. So I, I guess like the the, no, the non-exclusivity concern, I would say this is a paper about pointing like a bit like the default concern, like the, 
non-exclusivity can be optimal because it allows an option to dilute. So I, I would say that you know this is a paper in some sense about the positive side of non-exclusivity. Um, whether it's important that it's observable, I mean, I mean, I really don't know. I mean, our solution concept is a solution concept for observable data. I mean, if we, if, let me not take, let me not take too strong of a stamp. I, I, I we, 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 we can think about that about the episode. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Right. Uh, so, someone, please. Uh, so the long-term debt network and uh, Emre's earlier question, I was thinking about it. So, like, should we think of that network ar arising out of, for example, you know, a dynamic situation where projects are arriving and I don't have liquidity at the moment, you lend me some money. So there is really no room for bloating anything because it's not a contract that we sign on the spot. It's just, you know, you give me money and then I am not willing to promise you too much more to bloat it because that would require you to would require me to trust you that in the future when you borrow from me, you will also promise me a huge amount, like way more than right. Maybe like according to the scenario, according to the situation that leads to uh, that interbank that like long term debt network. I think it's possible that there may be room for artificial bloating if it was like derivatives contracts, right? We are writing some sort of insurance contract for some contingency that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. I think we can just bloat it up and we can use those numbers as collateral in the future. But mm -hmm. if it is more of a dynamic scenario where projects are arriving, liquidity is arriving, and at the moment I need to borrow from you and so on, and that sort of kind of builds up to this long-term integrated debt network, then maybe there's just no room for bloating. So maybe, you know, have you thought a little bit about like what you have in mind about this? No, I mean the dynamics. No, well, I think maybe this is a bit like too far, too too many steps. So I'd, I'd like to just show the stability of the network we have, which is just like you know, I lend you ten, you lend me nine, and we have mm -hmm. the appropriate interest rate, and we. Um, I think that's sort of the next step, and I, that way I think we can get to go to dynamics. I think is a so maybe a few papers down the road, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, so maybe let, let me just sort of defer that defer that for for maybe a long time, but uh, uh, but I I think it's a it's a fair it's a fair question. Um, okay, if that's okay, uh, let me uh, yeah just sort of, uh, uh, launch into the model. Okay, so there are two dates, just date one and date two. There's no discounting and universal risk neutrality. This is by the way just an overview. There are n banks, so you know me and Brianna and all of y'all, and each of us we're all ex ante uh, identical except for our interbank debt. So we each have assets Y that realize on day two. There's no risk, so by realize I just mean you know become uh, sort of that's when I, we can eat them. Uh, and, and there's a risk. There is a risk of a liquidity shock. Liquidity shock we call L if it's realized uh, is of size L if it's realized less than Y, and that's realized at date one if it, if it comes. There's an interbank network, and that's a network of long-term debts. So we call the network uh, F, and that's a network of debts from each bank I to uh, each bank J. These are their face values for all banks I and J. And when I say long-term, I mean that they're due at day two. We have one friction, as I've uh, previewed, which is limited pledgeability. So only uh, an amount theta Y, which is less than L of the long-term assets, is pledgeable. So let me uh, give you a bit more detail about these banks, which I call B1 through BN, and their balance sheets. So bank BI, that can be me. I've got my total liabilities, uh, total face value of liabilities, F double out arrow. And then that double arrow just means I'm summing over what all the other banks, what I, I owe to all uh, the other banks, J. So what I owe to Brianna, what I owe to Jing and so on. Uh, and claims, so that's on the other side of my balance sheet, these are the interbank assets. F double in arrow. So in arrow means that's what you owe to me. And a double arrow is because it's a sum over all other banks J, and that's what each of you pays to, uh, owes to me. Notice that for, mar uh, for those of you who are used to this kind of uh, model, the market clearing assumption is baked in here, that what I'm getting is what you're paying. All right, so there's an assumption that I'll make, which is that we have zero net debts. So my total debt to all y'all is the same as your total debt to uh, me for uh, every bank, for me and for each of you. So this is a fairly, I mean, not a, not a great assumption. It follows AOT, and it's maybe not a terrible approximation of reality in the sense that, you know, at least for HSBC, it seemed like uh, this was sort of within 10% of being true that the interbank assets were within 10% of the interbank liabilities. 
Okay, now each bank has some liquidity need, uh, L sigma I, and this is either L or zero. So that sigma I denote as an indicator of the shock. So if sigma I for bank I is zero, then the liquidity need is just zero. If sigma I is one, then the liquidity need is L. And the assumption here is that I am liquidated if I can't pay uh, L sigma, right? And that destroys the non-pledgeable part of my assets, one minus theta Y. Right. Now, what does it mean uh, can't pay? Can't pay means my pledgeable assets are less than my liquidity shock. So what are my pledgeable assets? My pledgeable assets are theta y, the pledgeable part of my long-term assets, plus the present value of my interbank claims. So I'm liquidated if these, I can't use all of these assets to pay my liquidity shock. So this is, uh, I think, uh, related to someone's first question. So the assumption is that any new debt Right, is senior. So I can pledge all of these assets to a new creditor. So as that would be the case with the repo in which uh, these are bankruptcy remote, they're senior, they're super senior. So they're senior to any debt, uh, including secure debt, by the way, uh, that is, um, I have outstanding my balance sheet. Right, so that of course means that my interbank liabilities, what I owe to all of y'all are diluted because I'm paying this new debt first. So those are sort of the primitives and then the uh, key endogenous thing are the interbank repayments. So I'm going to denote my interbank, uh, my equilibrium repayment to another bank, BJ, right, by the R from I to J. So that's what I pay to Brianna in equilibrium. So it could be the face value or it could be less than the face value. A bit more notation in case you haven't had enough. Are my total repayments, so R double, I double out arrow. So what I'm paying to all of y'all is just the sum over uh, of RI, my repayments to each of you. And double in arrow is the sum over the repayments that you all make to me. So these are my total interbank. And, this, and RI double in arrow, that's the value of my interbank claims. Okay, Jan, go. So the assumption that uh, if you have, uh, that if you have new debt, you have seniority. This is yeah. something that I think in your net in your model it will actually something that you would like to have in advance put in the contract. So basically, sometimes you can argue that they can put covenants, but it seems that your model actually banks would choose in advance to have this feature. Is it correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's sort of so that's exactly right. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up, and it sort of shows that the optimal that it's optimal to have this super seniority of repos. Cool. And in fact, one thing that I think is so, and it's optimal to have that this sort of covenant light. But one thing that's kind of interesting, I think, is that even if you borrow by a repo or borrow by a secure debt in general, in debt in violation of a covenant, so and we have a whole paper on negative pledge covenants, in violation of a covenant that uh, says, oh, you can't borrow with collateral, that secured guy actually still maintains his seniority. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we sort of show the optimality of that. So yeah, cool. thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Okay, so these repayments uh, have to satisfy sequential rationality. And I'm basically going to define, I mean, this is sort of the definition of sequential rationality because I haven't really told you the payoff structure. So it's a bit of a, I'm sort of cheating a little bit by putting these two things uh, together, but I, I think, it, I hope it will be uh, clear enough and feel free, of course, to ask it if it's not. Um, so, uh, so when, so BI, uh, the bank I is liquidated, right, at date one. Right. If what? If it's pledgeable assets, so that's me. So my pledge, my pledgeable long-term assets, theta y plus the value of my interbank claims. Right. Notice my interbank claims. I'm assuming are perfectly pledgeable here. I less than my liquidity needs. So if I if I play, if I take all my pledgeable assets and I can't pay my liquidity shock, I get liquidated. Everything goes to this outside liquidity shock. And my repayment to other banks is just zero. Now, if I don't get liquidated at date one, okay, then I continue uh, to date two, but I could still default at date two. And when do I default at date two? Well, if my pledgeable assets, uh, theta y plus the value of my interbank claims is less than not only my liquidity shock, but also what I have to repay to everybody else at date two. Now, this is also exactly what comes out if I uh, say sort of, sort of in the spirit of calling it sequential rationality, this is exactly what comes out uh, if I say I can just run away with one minus theta y and I run away optimally and that's, got, that's the same as defaulting. Right, so in this case, what do I repay? Well, my interbank liabilities don't get repaid in full. I repay them with what I have left from my interbank, uh, um, so for my pledgeable assets after I paid my liquidity shock. So I repay them, my interbank repayment is, well, I have my pledgeable assets, I pay my liquidity shock and what's left goes to the other banks. This plus here just nests the case in which I'm liquidated. So if I if this is a negative, then I'm in the liquidation case and I pay zero to the other banks. 
Now, of course, I might not default. And, you know, it's nice if I don't. In that case, I repay in full at day two. When do I do that? When this condition, with sort of the um, this condition is violated, which is when my pledgeable assets exceed the value of both my liquidity needs and my total debt. And of course, in that case, my interbank repayment is just um, uh, the face value of all my debt. So with that, we're ready to define. Oh, sorry. Let me. I have a note here, uh, which is note that liquidation is inefficient. Right? It destroys one minus theta y. Okay? So we want to avoid liquidation. Default alone at day two is not inefficient. Okay? It's just a transfer from uh, the default of the, the non-defaulting bank from the creditor to the debtor. Right? So that we. Uh, so the goal is to, in this sort of baseline, is to avoid liquidation. Pierre, please. Uh, Jason, sorry, just a quick question. So the liquidation shock is independent of your extra position. So how do you want to think of that, right? So it doesn't depend on uh, how much interbank borrowing and lending you have, right? So how should we think of these shocks? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so that's a totally fair question. So a couple of things, like I think if your bank has written uh, some insurance or written a derivative that gets uh, realized against it, I mean, those are two, I think, things that can be taken fairly literally to outside this interbank network. Uh, another possibility, which is I mean, a bit less literal, I think, uh, maybe requires a bit more, more modeling, but I think it's okay as a um, sort of to keep in your mind, is that they have some depositors and those depositors uh, have some with, uh, liquidity needs themselves and withdraw, withdraw all of a sudden. Uh, maybe, and by the way, I mean, this is also the more literal thing, like, which is you can think about it like it's, you know, this is sort of following home from Tirol. You can think, you know, as the bank has a machine that it has to operate uh, and that machine breaks down and you need to fix the machine. I mean, that's the sort of a really literal thing. I mean, maybe isn't the typical that. thing, isn't the typical thing to say in order to get Y, you just need some additional investment at date one, which is, oh, so that happens just randomly. Yeah, sure. That's that's also, that's also very good. I think that's uh, so that it could be that the uh, the firms that you've lent to the Y so is associated with Y. I like that too. That's good. Th th thanks, Emma. Okay, I just want to stress that so you know we're going to have lots of defaults. So this is sort of also about Emma's thing that blowing up the network can avoid liquidation, but could potentially increase defaults. But we're assuming those defaults on the baseline are not inefficient. Uh, in an extension, we say okay. Default is costly too, but it's not as costly as liquidation, which I think is a, a sort of good assumption. Um, so you want to continue, but you still don't want to default. You want to make your project is a really important thing. That's a real asset, but default could have also have some deadweight costs. And then to sort of speak to Emma's question, like then that can sort of say, okay, you want to have a lot of debt, but you don't want to blow it up infinitely because that if you blow it up infinitely, you'll default too much. Okay, so that's sort of enough to sort of uh, tell you most of what you need for the equilibrium. So we're going to talk about a payment equilibrium. It's a repayment profile profile for each bank I to each other bank J for what for every state. What's a state here? The only risk is the liquidity shock. So it's just a profile of liquidity shocks, such that repayments are sequentially rational per the previous slide, right? And then there's one other assumption, which is that the well, notice the sequential rationality, and I can just pop it back up for a second. It only tells me talks to you about my total repayments, right? This double error. It doesn't tell you about the profile of repayments, the I to J for each J. Because I don't really care whether I pay money to uh, Rihanna or Jing, I just care about how much I pay them in total. So to say how much I pay them each, we're going to make the assumption that repayments are made pro rata, which is also a pretty good assumption. What does pro rata mean? It means the ratio of what I pay uh, uh, to Brianna to what I pay in total, or equivalently the ratio of what I pay Brianna to what I pay Jing, is the same as the ratio of what I owe them. And of course, it's true if I repay them in full, and then in bankruptcy, there's a typical assumption, a typical uh, legal requirement, peri passu within the class of debt. So I, it says exactly this. So it's not this. I think is not such a bad assumption. Okay. okay, Pierre, you still have your hand up, but that's from before, right? right sorry, sorry. Uh, someone tell me. Morata, according to gross or net. Ah. Uh, so I don't know if it matters, but according I uh, hear it's according to gross, but I think. Yeah. So let me give you a timeline or a summary. This is just a heuristic, like everything for the solution is already uh, done, but uh, just to see what sort of just to sort of refresh what we what we've tried to capture. So I did one uh, shocks are realized. Uh, banks raise new uh, 
uh, liquidity to potentially meet these shocks, and then banks are liquidated or, or continue. Then if they continue at day two, the assets are realized and banks repay or demand. Okay. So uh, before launching into the results, a lot of our results are gonna have to do with efficiency. Okay. So our notion of efficiency is that one network is more efficient than another if fewer banks are liquidated for every state. Okay. There's a very strong ranking. It's a long way away from a total order. So in every single state, you have to have fewer, weekly fewer banks uh, liquidated. Okay. Now, uh, it turns out to be it's strong, but it turns out that for our results, we can prove them under the proof we need uh, using this definition. So, so we run with it. It's also worth, I think, pointing out that this is a strictly stronger definition than uh, AOT's notions of uh, stability and resiliency. So if we, uh, you know, if something is um, a network is more efficient by our definition, it's more stable and more resilient by theirs. So this sort of captures also systemic risk. Uh, I'd rather talk about efficiency than systemic risk in general. All right. So with that, I'm ready for the results. But I'm going to start with a benchmark, which is uh, short-term debt. Okay. So, so suppose. So what do I mean by short-term debt? Suppose all interbank liabilities, what I owe to each of you, they're due at date one. So they're due at the same time as a liquidity shock. And basically for our purposes or in general, I want to think about the, almost the definition of short-term debt as that interbank liabilities cannot be diluted with new debt at date one because they're due right away. So I can't dilute something that I better pay right away. So what does that mean? And that means that I'm liquidated if what? If my pledgeable assets, theta Y, plus the value of my interbank claims is less than not only my liquidity shock, which I have to pay right away, but also, my interbank debts, which are due right away, so I have to pay them, otherwise I'm going to get liquidated because I can't go forward from data one. Right? All this is in, this is in blue because it's the difference from the liquidation condition in the long-term debt model in the baseline. So this turns out to be exactly the same condition as the condition for defaults in our model. So liquidation in the short-term debt model coincides with default both in this model and it's the same equation as for the long-term debt model. So it turns out, and this actually is that this benchmark is actually isomorphic uh, to AOT, uh, sort of uh, mutatis mutandis. So this is a bit of Latin that I learned not that long ago, which means like with appropriate changes uh, when they're necessary. But basically, this nests um, uh, the this uh, the version of AOT under which they derive almost all of their main results. Okay. By the way, it wasn't obvious to us that this nested the model when we started working on it because we thought our model was sort of more about liquidity, theirs was more about solvency, but our model has a solvency component because L sort of actually very much in line with MRA's sort of interpretation decreases the value of the total product, so it has a solvency component. And for them, they're long-term assets you can't use to borrow at day one either, so um, that's sort of why they're the same. It's, uh, they're the same. Um, it's I think it turns out that the, bench the benchmark being isomorphic uh, is actually useful for uh, our presentation, but you can, yeah. So let me tell you sort of a couple of results, which are basically sort of by and large strengthenings of results in AOT. Okay. So the first one and the main one I'm going to stress is that debt decreases efficiency, right? So let F be regular. So regular means that my total debt or each of our total debt, uh, that's just the, so the total debt of each bank is the same for all banks, we call it F. And then the network alpha F is less efficient than the network F when alpha is greater than one. So increasing, all debts in the same proportion uh, decreases efficiency. So what does that mean? That means no debt for alpha equals zero is the best you can do, right? So the intermain network is just doing harm, right? And it means we should net out entirely in line with sort of policy discussion from the first page. So let me give you sort of a proof sketch uh, for this result, okay, this benchmark. So to do that, like say that BI, I, and BJ, Brianna, say Brianna, we have offsetting debts. So what I owe her is the same as what she owes me, and we'll just call that alpha F. Okay, so just a two bank example. And suppose that I'm the one who's shocked. Well, for me, the shocked bank, when am I liquidated? So this is just a liquidation condition with um, uh, short term debt. So it's my pledgeable assets, theta Y plus the value of my interbank claims, is less than the size of my liquidity shock. Remember, I'm shocked by assumption. Right. Plus what I have to pay her, and remember, it's the, it's the short-term debt model, so I've got to repay her at date one. But I just want to do comparative statics on alpha, right? So is high alpha good or bad? Right. Well, it turns out that I'm always liquidated, right? And you can see why. Well, because the first term, theta y, is less than L. That's by assumption, right? The, the liquidity shock is sort of the producer of not self-financing. And then R from I to J, so the value uh, of... Um, 
of uh, my claim on Brianna is less than alpha f. This is because she owes me alpha f, so the value of my claim on alpha f is less than or equal to alpha f given they're equal, so some sort of zero net effect. All right. Now that's me. So I'm always liquidated when I'm shocked. Now what about Brianna? She's not shocked. So when is she liquidated? Well, if the same condition, the value of her pledgeable assets, theta y plus the value of her interbank claims, that's less than, well, she's not shocked, so there's no L, it's just that she, but she has to pay me alpha f right away, right? So remember, I want to do comparative statics on alpha, and you can kind of see that increasing alpha is going to make this more, uh, sorry, going to make this easier to satisfy, and that means, means she's more likely to be liquidated. Okay, so the, oops. So this is satisfied if alpha is high enough. No, it's not quite as trivial as I made it out to be because R i to j also depends on alpha. So when I owe Brianna more, I also pay her more. So she gets more here, right? But the face value of the liability alpha f is always increasing faster than its present value. Right? If I owe Brianna another dollar, the value of my debt to her decreases by less than uh, by at most one dollar. So it's increasing faster than they claim the value of the claim. So increasing alpha makes Brianna more likely to liquidate it, so be liquidated. So I'm always, short bank is always liquidated. Not short bank is liquidated only when alpha is high enough. High alpha is bad. Okay. So overall, high short-term debt, it does create claims on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, but that's, that's true. So what I owe Brianna increases what she can pledge, and that in principle can make it harder for her to be liquidated. But these claims are more than fully encumbered and more than fully offset but the liability is created on the right-hand side. So increasing alpha on net is necessarily bad in the short-term demo. Right, so that's sort of the main benchmark. I want to tell you two results, two other results, which are sort of also AO, uh, uh, AOT results. Like I'll fly through them. So, so all banks close enough to shock. So this is sort of default radius. I'll state it informally. So all banks close enough to shock banks default. We formalize that by the harmonic distance and that ca which captures both direct and indirect links. So the intuition is that a shock bank's neighbors uh, provide it with liquidity, uh, and then their neighbors neighbors provide them with liquidity, and then the liquidity sort of all gets sucked into the short bank, and then all get liquidated. Okay, so overall, not short banks near short banks, they pay out so much that they can't meet their uh, that they can't meet. They should not say shocks that they can't meet their own repayments. Right, and sort of similar results on connectedness. Also, just informally stated is that increase in connectedness decreases efficiency. We formalize this using the AOT's bottleneck parameter and delta connectedness. And the intuition is that you know liquidations they propagate through the network just through the basically through the default radius at least for the bottleneck parameter result that's precisely the intuition. Okay, okay. So let me those sort of just have those there. You don't sort of there. That was surely too fast, but those are sort of just there as benchmarks. So let me tell you our sort of our main results. And the one I'm going to stress mostly is that increasing debt increases efficiency. So exactly diametrically opposed to the sort of benchmark one result with long-term debt. So let f be regular, right? With long-term debt, alpha f is more efficient than f whenever alpha is greater than one. So what does this say? Zero debt, alpha equals zero is the worst. Okay. And you should not net out. So let me give you sort of a proof sketch. So again, say so, that I'm- So, that, that, so that, that's where the assumption that default is not costly while liquidation is costly is super important, I guess, no? because the alpha greater than one just moves create more defaults <clears throat> in the last day in the last day so. so it doesn't it creates fewer liquidations at the um initial yeah. date it doesn't necessarily create more defaults at the last oh, day blowing up entirely does create more defaults so it has a i guess okay. maybe weekly more defaults maybe oh, it I is true. okay no, uh -huh. that's not even true but uh so but that we've only shown an example so in the sort of like for the exponential network we are going to have like for big enough deaths we get constrained efficiency and that's mm -hmm. right. but then we have examples where we say, okay, suppose default is costly. Can we create a network where we have mm -hmm. big enough debts that we don't get liquidations, but not so big that they don't they don't induce a lot of defaults? And the answer there is also yes. All right. So you can make you make debts big enough to avoid liquidation. You can pledge at date um, at date one, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to make them so big that you have a bunch of defaults at date. So is it true that if default is equally costly than liquidation in your sense? There would be just no effect at all, or so I don't know off the top of my head. Shabo, do you know the answer okay. to that? Uh, I think uh, if default is as costly as liquidation, then this uh, long-term debt has no difference from short-term debt. That's no different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so you need a 
So you need and just, so then I guess okay. as, mm -hmm. as long as the fault is mm -hmm. less costly, then this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, I mean, I hope I hope we think is, is reasonable. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I, mean, I guess that's where Emre's uh, suggestion is very important there, no? Because that naturally seems to make liquidation more costly than default. Um, no, I, but I think, but sorry, but by by oh, more costly than default. liquidation is, yeah. is costly because it destroys something real. It destroys. What yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Emre, the thing I think is just about the the sort of interpretation about what what does it mean to I mean what does it mean to destroy one minus theta y? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and that's sort of there's a real effect. I, I think that should be the thing mm -hmm. we want to avoid. Then, if we have sort of financial costs of default, exactly. I, mean, yeah. I, think, I think are reasonable. Then there's a cost as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I. But, they, but those that, one you, think, you you could say they're the same at both dates, I guess, and then. The, and, and then yeah, what I guess I'm trying to, trying to say I don't think it's very reasonable that we should think that they are the same. I mean, one one is really okay. destroying physical assets, destroying a product before maturity. The other is a mm -hmm. financial cost of bankruptcy or whatever. I agree right. that abstracting from that cost is not a perfect. It's not perfect, but uh, that uh, that it should be smaller. I think is, is the right the right assumption. Uh, we have a ten minute left as a reminder, okay, and we also you. have a fifteen minute uh, coffee break to discuss. So you can control the question as the way you want. Uh, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so let me tell you the the uh, mechanism here. So say that I and Brianna we have offsetting debts. So what I owe her is the same as what she owes me as alpha. So it's the same structure and I'm shocked, okay? But the, what all the changes are the liquidation conditions. So I'm uh, shocked, so I'm liquidated if what? If uh, theta y uh, plus the value of my interbank claims is less than the size of my liquidity shock. But now I can use all of my pledgeable assets to meet liquid my liquidity shock. That's what this zero here is. So I still have interbank liabilities, but because they're not due today, I don't have to pay them today. They don't encumber these uh, um, pledgeable uh, assets. So then we do compare to statics and we say, well, when is this true? Well, not if alpha is high enough, because remember what Brianna is paying me is increasing in alpha up to a limit, but uh, which she's gonna repay me enough under this condition, which I won't, won't talk about. So then we have, okay, so why was the intuition? Well, yes. My pledgeable assets themselves are not self-financing. They're not enough to cover my liquidity shock. But what Brianna pays me is increasing in alpha. The more she owes me, the more she pays me. And I can dilute my liability to her. I don't have to repay the liability at day one. I can dilute it before it's due at day two. It doesn't encumber me from raising liquidity at day one. So high alpha helps me meet my shock because there's more collateral and it doesn't encumber me on the other side. For Brianna, the notch bank, when is she liquidated? Well, she's liquidated. If her pledgeable assets, uh, so about theta y plus the value of her interbank claim on me, uh, are negative, and that's never the case. All right. And I say here because she can dilute this uh, interbank liability, but it's really because she has nothing due at date, which is sort of the same as saying she has nothing due at date, date one. Right. So high alpha is good for the short bank and doesn't affect the not short bank. High alpha is now good, exactly the opposite to the short term debt model. So overall, high long-term debt creates claims on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. They can be pledged as collateral to help meet a liquidity shock. And these claims are now not encumbered. They're not offset by the liabilities created on the right-hand side. So let me show uh, why, because they can be diluted. So this is where the option to value comes in. So just to give you a sense here, here's me as a short bank. Here's my balance sheet. My, I've got these assets. I've got why my liabilities say that I'm short, I get L. Remember, if this were my whole balance sheet, I would be a uh, toast because theta y is less than that. But it's not my whole balance sheet. I also have the debt from Brianna uh, to pledge. Sure, I've got debt to Brianna, but I'm going to dilute it. So what do I do? That's Those are both alpha. So these things I'm showing you are not offsetting. They don't have zero uh, in PV. Why? Because I take uh, new debt, pledging both y and alpha f, and I raise cash. And the amount of new debt I can take is y plus alpha plus the present value of alpha f because I just dilute, I get a transfer from Brianna by, by destroying the value of her, uh, her liability. So if alpha is large enough, I can raise enough cash. Right? And so you might think, uh, so maybe let me skip a few things. So I tell you that Brianna is not worse off ex-ante because she does it to me when, uh, when she's shocked. So sort of ex-ante, we have this offsetting option. Uh, there's a practical implementation in terms of repos and stuff. Uh, it complements the default uh, stuff that goes on, like in, in uh, these papers, like Alan and Gail, Dubikin, Tenacopoulos, and Shubik, and same. 
Um, but and then we have sort of co corresponding, like sort of diametrically opposed results for the salvation radius, which says you know banks close to a Nashad bank do not default, and that uh, and by connectedness, that increase in connectedness increases efficiency. So, so that's just so all of that is what you say. To, like, let me just tell you straight to the summing up that the long-term debt networks are really unlike short-term debt networks. Okay, so indebtedness and connectedness are sources of efficiency, and the reason is that the option to dilute these gross debts provides insurance. So the open question then is sort of do high indebtedness and connectedness at this point, you know, we're not going to answer it, to open the high indebtedness and connectedness suffice for a sort of efficiency. If I make things really indebted and really connected, yeah, they're increased efficiency, but are they enough to get all the way to constrained efficiency? And the answer is no. And what's the reason for that? So, and to see that, you can see that the, the complete network, which is fully uh, connected, is inefficient no matter the debt level. So so, to, so I'll show you this result and then I'll, let me see. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll say two words. Okay. So let S be the number of shock banks and suppose that there's not enough liquidity to go around. So the number of shock banks times the liquidity each shock bank needs is greater than the total liquidity that the system can raise. So all of the N banks can raise theta Y against their assets. So if S, F is complete, so every bank owes uh, every other bank the same amount, then all shock banks are liquidated. All right, so let me tell you the intuition. Well, the complete network delivers all shock banks the exact same net payment. Okay. And if, if there's not enough liquidity to save all of the banks and they're all getting the same and there's not enough to save all, so they each get the same insufficient amount of liquidity and none of them is saved. But so what you wanna do instead is prioritize the banks. You want, want to give, take enough liquidity to save one bank and give it to that bank. And then if you, once, if you have enough left over, save the next bank. And if you have enough left over, save the next bank. And then once you run out, you give nothing to all the banks you liquidate. Right? So the really inefficient thing here is that you're giving liquidity to banks that could be used to save banks, but you're not saving them. You're giving liquidity to banks that are liquidated anyway. Okay. Uh, so the question is how much better can we do? And I'll skip, I'll tell you how much better we can do. So, so, you can get with a network that is exponential with base S. So this is, I'm skipping the definition because I got to conclude. But that means that then, you know, one, you have a lot more debt to the first bank and you have less debt to the second bank. You have less debt to the third bank. And all banks are like that and their debt is decaying exponentially. So they, everybody owes a lot more to the first bank than they owe to the second bank. And basically you're implementing this priority. You're giving a lot of, you're giving enough liquidity to the first bank and then it gets saved. And once it gets saved, okay, then you can move to the second bank to the third bank. So by having this, this structure where the, uh, the debts decay, uh, you end up sort of implementing this priority structure and there's nothing basically going uh, to, um, to the sort of banks that end up getting liquidated anyway. So to say that, just, I'll tell you the formal result, like let F be exponential network with base S. S is how fast the debts decay. And S is small, that means it's decaying really fast. For alpha large enough, so high debts, then the network alpha F, is generically constrained efficient. Constrained efficient means you save, you use all the liquidity you can raise from the system to save as many banks as you can. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to skip all this stuff, uh, but I will conclude. Okay. So the offsetting long term debts provide insurance. Okay. So indebtedness and connectedness are sources of, uh, of efficiency, so, and they make, the, they make the network more stable. And that's really contrary to the conclusions based on short-term debt. So I think this, I, I hopefully uh, got to tell you in some detail. Then indebted connected and connectedness, they, they're not enough to implement efficiency with, with the complete network. You can't get to the constrained efficient outcome, but they are enough if the network structure is exponential, right? In the sense that they minimize the number of liquidations and they do that, and this I haven't told you, no matter the realization of shocks. And so we say that they're robust, but never fragile, these networks in the sense that uh, they're, they're stable, they implement the efficient outcome, they minimize the number of liquidations, and they're also robust in the sense that they, uh, their optimality does not depend on the realization of shocks in the robust control sense. Uh, so, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, coffee break discussions. You guys are free to just, you know, <laughs> unmute yourself. Yeah, Jason, sorry. Yes. Yeah, uh, on the last point, so it seems that the resharing requires that uh, I only issue long-term debt 
if I'm hit by a shock. Because if I can hit a shock, if I can issue long-term debt even when I'm not hit by a shock, then the whole thing seems to be unraveling, no? No, I would say no. So the long-term debt is in place at date zero, or at date one, or before the shocks arrive. Sorry, no, issue debt at date one, right? Uh, no, no, that's, yeah. no, absolutely not. Because so, then I can issue short-term debt, eat it up, default on the others. Uh, no, so this is important. So what we're not allowing, and this also relates to your aunt's question, is that I issue debt and then pay out a dividend right away. If I issue debt at date one, then I keep it in the coffers and that's basically, uh, sorry, then I keep the cash in the coffers and I cannot uh, steal the cash before day two. And why do I say it really? So, so that's the assumption. I, I, also, I also think it's a, it's a pretty sensible assumption for banks that cash itself is pledgeable. It's the same as the assumption in the sense that interbank assets uh, are pledgeable. There's basically are all cash like uh, uh, securities and you know, they, they are, uh, can be seized, seized uh, if I try to use them to, uh, to, try, to try to steal them. Um, why do I say it relates to your own question? Because you know, this is sort of a, um, I want to call it a stylized fact, but it's sort of my own, my own stylized fact. My, my impression is that restrictions on dividends, I mean, I guess, I guess from a law, a law point of view, it's a fact. I mean, from a, a contracting point of view, I'm not so sure. But restrictions on dividend payout are, are um, tighter than restrictions on taking new debt. So if I were legally to, like the, the laws, if I were to borrow and then you know, try to pay out a dividend to my mother-in-law, then creditors could claw that back in bankruptcy. On the other hand, if I have an unsecure, unsecure creditor and I issue a new debt that's senior to the uh, existing debt, then actually the existing creditor, even in violation of a covenant, then those uh, existing creditors don't have a claim on the creditors who lunch me. They only have a claim on me. Um, and that's cool in our model because they have a claim on the cash that, uh, that, I, that, I, that I hold as a result. Um, and we show that, that that's sort of that law that new uh, creditors can claw back dividends, but they can't claw back uh, sort of debt from other creditors is optimal. Sorry, Jason, can I, so I try to understand um, you, you, you allude this to uh, maturity, but couldn't we interpret it as um, the fraction of encumbered or secured or unsecured debt? So for yeah, example, yeah. for example, if it is, if it's a long, if it's a long-term ripple that is secured against the treasuries or whatever collateral, then it take away the dilution option, then it would not, fit the model you have in mind. So it seems to yeah, me- it's I like basically that, agree. So yeah. It's really, I mean, you know, we've, we've Shabo and as well, right? so we have Shabo and Jordan, I have talked about this a lot. Um, Shabo, by the way, you can also jump in at this point, I guess, right? Uh, um, that um, sort of what, are, what, are, what should we call it and what are we capturing? So uh, basically for us, the definition of long-term debt is dilutable. So it's really about the dilution option. I, I strongly agree. Um, sort of, I think we took the vantage point of maturity largely because that's sort of the, the point where we think it really contrasts with the literature. Right, because I, th I think you suppose you interpret it slightly differently, the, the secured and or undilutable amount of debt, then you can structure whatever you call the um, exponential networks by structuring the a fraction of secured and unsecured debt to my neighbor mm -hmm. banks differently. So I thought you would have kind of richer implications on the on this dimension as well. I mean, I, I think the implication, I mean, maybe, I mean, we can definitely, the implication is just, it's, I don't know if it's richer or not. It's sort of a bit a bit more about the fraction of dilutable debt. I mean, that's the implication, I think. Like the, or the amount of dilutable debt. I think, I think basically, you know, as you saw, you don't really want to have non-dilutable debt. You're better off netting out the non-dilutable interbank debt in, in this model, right? That's the short-term, I mean, in the sense of the short-term debt benchmark, it seems like you shouldn't really have it. So, Can you know, I, I, by the way, not just say like, a, you could easily come with a criticism, I think after what I just said, to say, well, wait, there is some short-term debt your model doesn't explain that. Not to say that our model should explain the whole world, but uh, I think it does explain why you might have some non-dilutable debt because that's what you take on at day one to meet your liquidity shock. So sort of, 
like syndrome, you do have a mix of dilutable and non-dilutable. And the I guys, think please, is there is also another aspect is that we have this like a maturity mismatch between the asset and the liability, and this is more natural with a long term uh, debt is versus uh, instead of for, like a secured versus unsecured. Let's go back. So, sorry, I, I, we have no minute, but is it Levant? I have not. Uh, you had your hand up since the beginning. No? Yes, thanks. Uh, just, I just want to come back to this issue of um, what would happen if banks could choose the maturity of their initial interbank debt. Um, so, I know, I know you don't do this in the paper, but uh, if they could choose the, the the maturity of their initial debt, I assume that they would internalize to some extent um, the fact that long term debt can be diluted, and so it would be more costly to issue that sort of debt. So some of the benefits um, associated with long-term debt would accrue only off equilibrium. Do you, do you have a sense if that's the case or? So off equilibrium in a sense, well, it's on equilibrium for some states, right? So so I can we can do the whole thing with two banks. So you and I, or let's stick with Brianna. So Brianna and I are two banks. Um, then, we can issue just straight up offsetting debts. So, so the prices are all the issues of interest rates are embedded in the face values. Like she owes me half, I owe her half. If she's shocked, then you know I'm better uh, than I. My debt to her is sorry, her debt to me is diluted, so that I suffer in that sense, and I make a transfer. I effectively make a transfer to her. And uh, uh, and if I'm shocked, then her debt to me is diluted, and she effectively make a transfer makes a transfer to me. Ex ante, we share equal fractions of the total surplus, uh, which is the, the optimal thing to do. Okay, so if they could choose the maturity of their initial debt, uh, it's not the case that they would um, choose to issue short term debt because they, you know, because it can't be diluted. Is that right? No, absolutely not. It's like they're, they're willing to, so each of us is willing to accept the risk of dilution. And for the borrowing, I mean, look. I think you can even say this without without the offsetting that. So, you know, it may be that I know that I might have get a liquidity shock. I know that in the event of a liquidity shock, I'm going to be way better off if I can liquidate. If I sorry, if I can dilute, I'm willing to pay a premium in the other state when I'm not shocked for that option to dilute in the in the state when I'm shocked. Yeah. So, and then Brianna, you know, she just asked me the fair price. I know that there's value to the dilution option. She gets the compensation for it. I'm willing to pay it. She gets the compensation for the dilution option. We issue long term. Uh, thanks. Brianna, people are being very like. Yes. Um, <laughs> sure I don't know if I uh, should no. take the questions or you, or we should just tell them to start raising their hands. Jason, uh, Kai, Kai, follow up. Please. Yeah. So, um, so the the question I asked earlier about um, uh, bilateral relationship uh, um, is uh, try to provide motivation why we want to provide co insurance when there's uh, a yeah. um, um, when there's a liquidity shock. Um, in your case, you you just uh, study exogenous alpha, right? The higher, lower. To see the comparative status sure. on that, right? so um, um, uh, presumably uh, it's more difficult, obviously. So you you would say why they want to? Um, in your case, it seems to me it's not actually you borrow, um, not actually from other. It is actually borrow. You borrow from they borrow in a, um, from other um, other banks on the interbank network. Or is it just you raised collateral? I'm a little bit confused about the comparative static exercise because on one hand you say I can just borrow uh, based on my gross um, uh, uh, asset position with the cash, right? So that's cash um, borrowing is it from the from the same counterparty, right? So you have increased. Uh, no, um, so yeah, this is an important point. So, so we we. I mean, Anyways, I think so in general, yeah. yeah, that's a confusion on my part. It's more about uh, how 
for the modeling works. But uh, I saw this nice point is um, you actually, um, it's uh, much easier to raise money within the network than because the potential co-insurance. And so that may provide some sort of uh, micro foundation that is explanation for bilateral relationship, um, banking relationship could lower the borrowing cost. Um, in the time of war crisis, exactly how this network come in. Um, obviously, you are now the um, you are doing comparative static exercise to illustrate this point. Um, right. Yeah, just um, I just need to get a little bit clear idea how this exercise been been done. I guess I yeah. So I guess maybe just to build a bit on what you said. So one thing I think is maybe just stress that. This co-insurance increases debt capacity, but it doesn't only uh, increase debt capacity within the network, it increases debt capacity also from a third party. This is a, in, yeah, distinction would be nice to highlight. Thank you. Can I add a point, uh, Casey? Actually, in our model, uh, if you borrow when the liquidity shock occurs, your debt capacity from inside the network or outside that network is identical because all the uncertainty are resolved. They don't get a benefit from like having this relationship. And basically we're seeing even without this like a explicit relationship, like getting a discount from borrowing from uh, from the insiders, having this uh, gross position still helps. Well, it's the insurance, ex-ante insurance, yeah. not when, when the yes, shock yes. occurs. What I'm trying to say, you actually get this mm -hmm. co-insurance as an option, or you can exercise uh, mm -hmm. or the so insurance, right? It's not the, it's not when the shock, you buy the insurance before the shock occurs, not when, after uh, yeah, the yeah. shock occurs. So Jason, can I? Yeah. So, so basically, I mean, I'm still going to the assumption. So you said I, so I think, again, it, it seems that in your case, sometimes we would like to have co uh, put covenant, not to put covenants. I think that even if they had covenants initially that says that they cannot issue the short-term debt, it seems that in many cases still they would like to negotiate it exposed. Because, and you can try to find some other delusion. For example, I'm putting less effort or the chance of default. So I think you're, it's kind of stronger than what you just have. So this assumption first, maybe you don't even need it. Even if you put it, probably they would negotiate it exposed. So that sounds like the idea that that sounds like my okay, I hope what I said was also pretty strong, but uh, if it's strong. Yeah, yeah, but you can make it even stronger. Yeah, I think it's strong and I think it's even stronger than what, what you have. Yeah, right. th 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 thanks a lot. Yeah. But uh, will it work with two banks? So at your onset, I'm not sure. I think so. Like, it will. That's, it so. that's basically, know. that's the also the risk. That's also the reason why inside the liquidity and outside is the same because it will work exposed with two banks even. Exposed, you mean after the real shock? Right. Basically, if there are two banks and one of them is shocked, the other bank is willing to lend against its own face value, the, the uh, like, uh. Or whatever, right? Because they're saying like, if you are liquidated, I don't get anything. So it's better to, to get to the second period. Maybe I will get something. Uh, this kind of renegotiation, sure, sure. But this, uh, so I don't want to go too far down this renegotiation route because this is a criticism I think of like all the short-term debt results, right? Like also AOT that you know if you could renegotiate out, anticipating getting, um, anticipating that I'm going to get liquidated and then you're going to get zero, then you might just even want to waive your short-term debt, right? Um, I just so think that the think... ex post and ex ante, what Yaron was saying is important. It's not, it like wasn't clear what are the conditions when ex post you you are willing to be diluted on the debt that they own to you. But we're not giving a choice about whether you're willing to be. I, That's I, right. I but I, he, he's trying he's trying to relax the assumption to say that even if you would give a choice, maybe ex post you will willing to do it. And I'm not sure like under what conditions it's true or not. I understand. Like, I think that your, your point though is more like you might be willing to be diluted too much, <laughs> right? That that I think I think what he said is right, but then it also could sort of screw up the the canonical models. That's more my my take. So I'd rather, you know, I'm, ha I'm happy to I'm happy to agree with your own, but then if we want to go too far down this route, I, I kind of want to say that 
an assumption of this literature is no renegotiation, uh, which I don't like. And you know, in my other non other papers, I, I you know, my co-author Denis would would uh, you know kill me for saying this. I think, but, uh, and you know, certainly in our work, uh, we're, we're, we take that very seriously. Uh, I'm going to end the official recording, but you all guys are all welcome to keep ask Jason questions. Thank you guys very much. Thanks again, uh, Brianna. It's been a total pleasure to to talk to to some of you I haven't seen in a while.